welcome to a new segment of A View into the Collection. I'm Amy, your host, and the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center's Curator of Collections. In a world of meticulously painted polychrome pottery, pottery wares or stunning black designs on white, there is something special about a micaceous clay vessel. What looks like a simple shape, either with a handle or two, and oftentimes with wisps of dark gray and black areas, a micaceous clay form pot carries valuable information about tradition, economics, and art. In Stephen Trimble's book, Talking with the Clay, The Art of Pueblo Pottery in the 21st Century, the notion of tradition is quoted by scholar Bruce Bernstein as a set of, quote, mythological principles frozen in place by curators and collectors, end quote. Before collectors and museums, we can step back to the 1800s when the Santa Fe Trail and Railroad brought an influx of commercially manufactured kitchenwares, traders, and tourists. New opportunities for trade and commerce emerged, and the option to cook with enamelware and tin pots and pans became a reality. Also of note is the influence of anthropologists who made their way into the Pueblo realm in the 1900s. However, the pottery making traditions of the Pueblo people are what carried the forming of micaceous clay vessels from a highly utilitarian ware to a more individualized and creative art form. Let's back up to understand the significance of pottery wares made with micaceous clay. The northernmost pueblos here in New Mexico are situated in mountainous terrain, and it is here in geologic formations of igneous and metamorphic rock beds that potters gathered clay rich in mica. The pueblos in the Sangre de Cristo mountain range are Taos and Picaris to the north, and a bit south are the pueblos of Nambe, Powake, and Tesuque. The flecks of mica in the clay provide a natural temper to the clay, and this is the magic ingredient. The magic is twofold. First, your eyes are drawn to the shiny golden hues and tiny flecks that catch the light. The curves and added three-dimensional elements, or the stray wispy black cloud left over from a flame during the firing process, it all combines to create a visually appealing vessel or work of art. Second, the mica's gritty and coarse nature provides a solid base that when fired forms a durable container that can hold liquid and is suitable for cooking. That leads us to two micaceous bean pots. The two bean pots illustrate a typical shape of a wide and open neck that lead down to a rounded body with a low shoulder finally tapering to a slightly narrow and flat bottom. Bean pots often have a single handle. The interior of this bean pot made by Cora Durand of Picaris Pueblo is a wonderful smoky gray color. This was likely achieved by a process called smudging, which means an organic material such as sawdust was placed inside the pot after the firing and when the clay was still hot. Otherwise, to achieve an overall black color, one must reduce the amount of oxygen during the firing process. Duran's bean pots boast a single handle and a delicately wavy rim. The exterior is mostly golden in color with some darkened areas called fire clouds. These darkened areas occur during the firing process and are present on many micaceous pottery wares. Cora's work with the micaceous pottery making tradition started in the 1950s. Previous to that, she worked various jobs for the Bureau of Indian Affairs and at the Pueblo of Picaris. Later, she taught her grandson, Anthony, how to form micaceous pottery wares. The second bean pot was lovingly created by another Picaris potter named Virginia Duran. She says, quote, Picaris pots are thin, not heavy like Taos, end quote. 
She refers to the amicable rivalry between potters at Picaris and the Pueblo of Taos. Both are best known for their micaceous pottery vessels. Virginia was known for adding a slip of mica to her pottery before firing, which imparted an incredibly rich sparkle. This technique is visible on her bean pot and the bowl with four nodes at the rim. A slip is produced with a thin wash of micaceous clay. The sparkly bowl by Virginia boasts thin walls and four small nodes set equidistant just below the rim. The vivid shine is a good example of a finished micaceous clay vessel. Aside from the practical nature of the bean pots and bowls that were used for cooking and serving food, somewhere along the way, potters working with micaceous clay found inspiration to produce aesthetically pleasing vessels. Perhaps they were inspired to craft visually appealing works after art markets became the norm. No doubt the influence of other potters and artists working in mediums, different mediums is hard to ignore. I like to believe that an artist who works with his or her hands and has a long familiarity with their medium eventually finds inspiration from within. Earlier I mentioned that Cora Durand taught her grandson Anthony the pottery making knowledge she had learned. When she returned to Picaris in the 1950s and after her husband passed away, she began making pottery. At this time, she would have been in her late 40s. Though I could not locate information about who taught her the pottery making process, she eventually excelled at it and her reputation as a potter quickly grew. She found new sources of clay near Picaris while she continued to work in other capacities. Her pottery making knowledge was shared with other community members and eventually with her grandson, Anthony. Anthony formed this gorgeous and shiny micaceous bowl shaped in an ellipse and accented with two gentle dips and small nodules at each long end. After returning home from university, he focused his time on making pottery beginning in 1977. He said, quote, I felt motivated to keep the tradition going and my grandmother taught me to make lids and handles which I found quite difficult at first, end quote. It took him some years to gain confidence and skill with the clay and soon after he found success at various art markets and sold many of his vessels at the Millicent Rogers Museum gift shop in the town of Taos. In 1994, he was invited to participate in a micaceous pottery convocation at the School for Advanced Research in Santa Fe. Lonnie V. Hill of Nambe Pueblo was asked to facilitate the 1994 convocation of micaceous potters as part of his tenure as a Ronald and Susan Dubin Native American Artist Fellow at the School for Advanced Research. He was also a participant with Anthony and eight other potters who work with micaceous clay. The two selections I made of Lonnie's work include one small bronze micaceous bowl and one black bowl created in the oxygen reduction firing process. Both are incredibly thin-walled with an eye-catching sparkle. The mica shines through on both, giving them what looks like a view of the Milky Way in the night sky, especially the black bowl. Lonnie's career arc began as an accountant and financial analyst. He later realized it was time to go home to Nambe and pursue other means of financial stability. As he roamed the areas around his home, he found deposits of clay and slowly began to experiment with the clay. Rather than learn from a grandmother who was a potter, Lonnie taught himself the art of making vessels. He credits Clay Mother as his teacher and says, quote, Clay Mother will select someone to take up her work, sometimes a person who seems least likely, end quote. As he slowly worked with various clay types and found necessary tools, he says, quote, it was becoming clear to me that my goal was to serve as a guardian of the clay, 
to keep pottery making alive in my Pueblo and to share it with the world, end quote. V. Hill eventually won best of class awards at the prestigious Santa Fe Indian Market and his work can be found in many private and public museum collections. An outlier from the northern New Mexico Pueblo potters is Hopi potter Preston Duwayani. His work with micaceous clay is on full display with this large reduction fired bowl. The symmetrical bowl includes his signature placement of sterling silver inlays near the rim. Preston calls the wavy detail on the silver inlays shifting sands and is in reference to the Hopi village in Arizona where he grew up. A land of heat and sand is much different from the mountainous terrain in northern New Mexico. Preston is married to Santa Clara Pueblo potter Deborah Duwayani. The two met while attending the Institute for American Indian Arts in Santa Fe. So perhaps it is his time spent living in this area that influenced his art. Located on New Mexico State Highway 150 is an official scenic historic marker honoring Taos Pueblo potter Virginia T. Romero. Virginia lived a long and fruitful life alongside her husband and 10 children. Her work with micaceous clay began in 1919 and she continued to make vessels until her last year of life. The tall jar presented here features a round body with three sculptural lizards playfully formed along the pot. The dark fire cloud only enhances the overall finished look. I am impressed with her long and productive life. Virginia said in all her years of making pottery, she never lost one in the firing process. She said that grinding the clay to a very fine consistency and firing only with wood allowed her great success. I can only imagine how distressing it would be to have a pottery piece break during the firing process. The last two micaceous wares I want to show you today are two more examples of an individual's talent. The small bowl with an elegantly curved rim was made by Bernice Suazo Naranjo of Taos Pueblo. One can see raised areas where the use of her smoothing tools was left slightly undone. Whether or not she meant to do that, I don't know, but in a way it's like leaving behind a fingerprint. She now creates finely detailed sgraffito designs on a sienna colored slip, which could be inspired by her sister-in-law, Jody Falwell of Santa Clara Pueblo. Finally, this remarkably shaped bowl with soft rounded rim elements will leave us remembering what draws us to micaceous clay. The sunny bronzy hues with glints of mica reflecting light. I never get over how thin the walls are on each pottery piece. It looks like the potter placed wisps of what could have been horsehair inside the bowl after removing it from the fire. The very thin lines almost look like veins in a rock formation. This bowl is signed on the bottom, Okwupovi, who is from Nambe Pueblo. Though I did not choose all the micaceous pottery wares in our collection, and believe me, it was difficult to choose. The variety of practical and aesthetically pleasing wares is plentiful. I shared various micaceous wares from many Pueblos and one from the Hopi tribe, and I hope you enjoyed the vessels I chose. Until next time, I thank you.